All right, everybody. We're going to get started in just a couple moments, but I do want to make sure to announce all CA students are being asked to sit in the front sections. So if you don't mind, make room for CA students right down front. We want them front and center. We'll get started here shortly.
All right, everybody, let's come on in and grab a seat. The chairs are filling up. We've got some additional chairs, but the balcony is open. I want to make sure y'all know we do have plenty of seats up in the balcony, and we can grab some chairs if needed. But we've got a few seats. But All right, so before we start, let's all stand and go to the Lord in prayer. God, we thank you for the privilege of being in your house tonight, God, on this big Monday. Lord, we ask that you anoint this time. God, enlarge our thinking, our minds. God, for your glory and your honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Hey, I want to thank every one of you for being here tonight. This, this is the, unless anything changes, this is the only session we're going to have for this spring semester. And as you heard last night, we are racing full speed ahead to camp meeting. And so we are about to get into, into that gear and in that mode. Did anybody enjoy the, the wonderful food out there in the lobby? I'd be embarrassed if I told you how many of those cookies I've eaten in the last couple of weeks. Those things are dangerously addicting. <laughs> hey, I want to thank uh, all those listening online we are streaming line, online on Holy Ghost Radio, and we have our video stream going. You can find that on facebook.com slash truthcollege. You can also find that on YouTube, and you can go back at any time and watch these and listen to these. YouTube, uh, do a search for Truth College at the Rock, and you're going to see, see our stream, stream there. And uh, there's a, a whole team that brings us together, and I want to thank them. We've got a an amazing tech team that you very rarely see, you very rarely hear, but that's because they're doing their job so well. So that, that shows you how, how flawless of a team we've got, and we're always thankful for that. Our, spe our speaker tonight, I'm really excited to introduce to you. He comes all the way from Belleville, Texas. Uh, he is the founder and CEO of a company called Relation Shop. They own several businesses under, under that some being Store AI or Mercatus, you'll hear, hear more of the story. And I actually, before we, we reached out and, and invited him, I was going to do some really deep dive research on this gentleman. I really did everything but a full background check. And uh, so I called a buddy of mine who's actually in the grocery business for a, a large Texas-based grocer, and I said, hey, have you ever heard of Store AI, Mercatus? I listed a couple of the names. He said, have I heard of them? We give them so much data, it's ridiculous. I said, really? And, uh, and I told him kind of what was going on. He said, you know what? That makes sense. We have internally had meetings wondering how on earth this relationship is growing so fast and so big. And hearing there's an apostolic at the head and the hand of God is on that business is all that I need to hear. And so it, we were, uh, I was excited to hear that. And to top it all off, as many of you have heard, he's also one of the co-authors of Into His Marvelous Light one of the quintessential apostolic Bible studies, and they've got a follow-up to that, Guide for Living. And I know we're probably going to get these in the bookstore, so make sure to, to get some copies and use that. And so I'd like to welcome Brother Galen Walters. Can y'all help me welcome Brother Walters? We've asked him to come and take his liberty, share his story. Brother Walters has brought his, his wife, Sister Mickey, here with us, so... By the end of the night, Brother Walters is going to speak, and she may end up preaching. So we'll, we'll say, hey, we're going to have a good night. I'm excited. Thank you, Brother Walters, Let's for being see. here. Thank you. You're welcome. Welcome. Love to be here. Well, thank you very much. Um, very excited about being here. Let me get back to this. Can you shift this over? So obviously I am very humbled to be standing here tonight. I never thought in a million years. I've driven past this place going to, from, from Houston up to the Ozarks and to St. Louis many, many, many times. And every time we go by, I've taken pictures. I've, I've, uh, we've talked about it. Uh, I have friends that know the pastors here very well. And so we, we know a lot of people that know each other. Uh, so we're kind of connected in weird ways, but I uh, never thought in a million years I would be standing here. And um, Brother Matt, I would like to give him an accolade. I've never met a more tenacious, uh, he should have the name Magnetic in his middle name or something, Matt the Magnetic or something, because once he's got you, he does not let go. 
He has hung on for dear life. He's called me over and over, and we've had great conversations. Uh, he's caught me in some strange places, and we just continue to talk. So, But also glad that Mickey's here tonight with me. My wife is sitting right back here. Wait, raise your hand. Yeah. So I would like to also honor this church. I, we were here yesterday morning and last night and uh, never been in a more powerful service in my life. And those two services were just amazing. And uh, my hat's off to you guys. Thank you. And I got to meet, I got to meet your bishop back uh, about a month ago in Vider, Texas, Brother Matt Tuttle's church. I'm part of uh, Kingdom Works. I was part of founding that with Brother Tuttle and... Your bishop's been there a couple times. I'd never met him before until a month ago, and we met, and uh, uh, it, it's been a really neat connection for me, and uh, just really enjoyed talking to him. What great stories, and he told me uh, some wonderful stories about the land business over here and how it got started, and he gave the whole, whole story to us, so I was very fascinated by that. I'm an entrepreneur and uh, love business, uh, kind of addicted to business, unfortunately, in, in, a, in a strange kind of way, but... Um, I will, I will talk a little bit about that tonight. And I, I would like to say, number one, I'm not real fond of talking about this stuff. Uh, he's kind of twisted my arm to get me to do this. I don't think I've ever done it in a large setting like this. So um, I'm a little bit cautious, but uh, I hope you can understand that. But I am going to tell the story and uh, hopefully it'll take you to, on a journey maybe that uh, can, you can relate to, or maybe it can help you in some way. Also very thankful, I got to meet Brother Nathan tonight, and I'd never met Brother Nathan Holmes, and uh, very, very honored to do that and look forward to getting to know him better. So uh, really appreciate the care these guys have given us. I mean, the hotel, the basket of stuff, I don't know who made that, but it's got something, it's almost got one of everything in it. I mean, it's just, and I've eaten half of it probably, so uh, I'll be gaining some weight out of this. So I, I would like to say that uh, that what I'm going to be talking about tonight, I'm going to start off on one vein. I'm going to shift gears, and then at the end of it, I'm going to shift gears again because I've got a couple couple points I want to get across to you. But I, I call this on purpose because from a very early age, uh, I have been entrepreneurial. I, I will say from from childhood, really, I started mowing yards at 11 and never stopped working, and I've loved to work and loved to to give. And uh, so working has become part of my, my MO, I guess. And my wife probably uh, many times wishes it wasn't quite as much an MO as it is, <laughs> but uh, she has been incredible to, to allow me to work like I do and do the things I have done. So I want to get started on this and I'll, I'll move along here. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And so I, I, I get to talk to a lot of people and I have a leadership lab at my farm and I have a lot of people there, a lot of pastors. We've had over 60 pastor couples at our farm in the last four years and uh, they stay for several days. So we get a lot of dialogue in and we talk about a lot of things, but purpose always seems to be the anchor point for all of us is living on purpose and living on his purpose. And I also get a lot of individuals that I end up working with. And uh, one in particular that I can recall, uh, he told me, he said he was in his 60s and he said, I'm still searching for God's will in my life. And that's very frustrating to me <laughs> because when you're 60 years old, hopefully you have found God's will for your life. And so I was talking to him out in the parking lot of our church one day and I said, look, I said, you do all this wonderful stuff for the church, and I can't imagine you not thinking you're in God's will doing that. And he said, well, I was called to preach, I think. I said, well, it's a little late for that, so you know, let's shift gears here. So we, we got to talking about purpose, and I said, you know, when we're called according to his purpose, what is his purpose? And so we talked about that, and his purpose is that no man is lost. That's God's purpose. He wants all men to be saved. That's the scripture, right? So here we are struggling to figure out what God's will is for our life. It really doesn't matter in the way I think about this. It doesn't matter what occupation you have. As long as you're planting seed every day, you're in his will. Now, there may be some calling that you get to go do something unique, and that's wonderful, and I honor that. 
But I lived my entire early existence feeling a little bit condemned because I wasn't a pastor. My mother called me to preach when I was a kid, but God didn't. <laughs> but mothers can mess you up a little bit when they tell you you're going to be, going to be a preacher and you find out, you know, you're 30 years into this thing and it's like, I don't remember hearing that, you know? And if he called, where was I at at the time? Or where was I? So uh, I'm, 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 I'm pretty focused on this purpose thing because I do believe that if we understand that we're called according to his purpose, we shouldn't question what God's will is for our life. Our will is to serve his purpose. And that should be fairly simple for us to do. I'm gonna dwell just a minute on this slide because this is kind of the foundation. Uh, and I found this about six months ago and it has shaken my world a little bit. It's by a guy named Miles Monroe. He's, a, he's a, uh, some kind of evangelist in some other organization and may not even be apostolic and I really don't care because what he says here is earth shaking to me. It says, there's eternity in your heart because God placed it there. Knowing your purpose and the time associated with it will allow you to be effective and productive in your living, using the time he gives you for the purpose for which he gave it. The proper use of time is always dependent on the priority of purpose because time is an interruption in eternity that allows you to fulfill what you were sent here to do. He who has time to burn will never give the world much light. Killing time is not murder, it's suicide. Killing time is not murder, it's suicide. And I love this, script, this sentence right here. The proper use of time is always dependent on the priority of purpose because time is an interruption in eternity that allows you to fulfill what you were sent here to do. So I think if, 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 if you can process this and get your head wrapped around it, it took me a while to get my head wrapped around it, but when I realized that every minute I waste not serving in the kingdom, not doing something for the kingdom, whether it's in my business or whether it's at the Bible study, we need to be on purpose every day. We don't have time to waste. You agree with that? So, and I know you do or you wouldn't be sitting here, but I think this is something that is, is really, uh, has really changed me in the way I think about purpose. Many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. And we've all had that bit put in our mouth and moved around a little bit when we're off purpose. Have you not? I have. And then this is Max Dupree's statement, and I'll stop with the slides and the, and the, the statements. It says, when I consider the reasons to volunteer or work for a movement, it helps to remember this ineluctable fact of life. We are sentenced to live with who we become. Isn't that the truth? We're sentenced to live with who we become. So if we're not careful, we can become something we're not very proud of. If we're not careful, we can waste a lot of years fretting over things that do not matter at all. And we waste our time on things that don't matter at all. And we can waste our time in endeavors that don't matter at all. All right. So I want to show you a little slide here. This is organizational excellence slide. And I'm, I'm showing this because of this why right here. So this is something the Lord gave me about 10 years ago. And I've used it. I use it in my business. I use it working with churches. I use it with pastors. Uh, it's, a, it's a very instrumental tool for me. So why? The why is purpose, strategy, and vision. That's where the thinking's done in an organization. The what is where all the planning, the assessments, the prioritization, and the goal setting happens is down in the what. That's where we do all the planning work. And then the how is on the managing side of things where we delegate tasks. And, and the what and the how is where most of us end up spending most of our time. What am I gonna do? How am I gonna get it done? What am I gonna do? How am I gonna get it done? And we get caught in that rut over and over and over. And the last part of this is the wow. And that's where the real leadership takes place and that's the testimony and celebration part. So most organizations end up down here stuck in the what and the how. Have you ever been stuck in that area in your life where you're not really thinking about vision, you're not thinking about the future, all you're thinking about is this is what I've got on my calendar, this is what I have to get done. I work with a lot of churches and most of the time we end up in calendar events where we're doing nothing but setting calendars over and over and over and over. And so 
the, the, the problem with that is that you're, you're losing the, the context of why it is we're doing this to begin with. Why are we here? Why did I get up today? Why am I standing up here? I told my wife driving over here today, I said, I don't know why I do these things. I don't know why I torture myself through these things. And she said, you do it because you're supposed to be doing it. So, <laughs> but you, you do start, you, we would be crazy not to ask ourselves, why am I doing this? Why, why do I get up every day? Why am I apostolic? What's the purpose of all this? Y'all are looking at me like a bug in a jar. So movements, though, operate out of the why and the wow. All right? They operate out of vision. And vision is nothing more than wrapping a story around your purpose so people can follow it. Think about that. Vision is nothing but a statement, Right? But where does the statement come from? It comes from your purpose. And if you want people to follow you, if you have a worthy purpose and you can convince people to follow you, they'll follow you off the, off the cliff. Just look around. Look at all the organizations that, are, that people are following that really have no real basis. You know why? Somebody cast some vision that somebody bought into. So if we're not careful, we can follow the wrong vision. So what we have needs to be rooted and grounded in the scripture, right? And we're supposed to test everything against the scripture. And you should test everything against the scripture. And I do. So this little model uh, is something that I use all the time and teach all the time. But I wanted to show it to you because of the why. Because that's really what we're here talking about tonight is our purpose. And so the very foundation of everything that I'm going to talk about tonight really goes back to my core purpose. Why am I here? What did God call me to do? And, and what am I doing with it? How, how do I accomplish this? So I want to move over to the Bible studies right now. And this is not an ad. I'm not asking you to buy anything, so relax. But I just wanted to show you into his marvelous light. We just went live with this uh, two years ago, September uh, in 22, in the mobile app. So it's on the Google Play Store and on the Apple Store. It's free. And so right now there's four languages in the app. We will have two more languages loaded at the end of the month. And we're trying to load as many languages as we can. Currently, we, we wrote the Bible study in 1987. There was three of us authors. Uh, it was a wonderful journey. I had a little Macintosh uh, 128K with a floppy disk. You remember those little Macs about this big? A little 128, had a little floppy disk. And so I had a little program that I could design in, which was a joke looking back on it. But we designed the Bible study, the old version that someone's got here tonight. They brought it, and let me see, she's sitting right back there. She has one of the original 1988 versions in her bag that she's got scriptures written all throughout it. So I was very honored that she had, there it is right there, which is really cool. That's the very first Bible study we printed. And uh, so, but what we would do is we would work on the Bible study. There was three of us that were the authors of it. We almost killed each other during the process. It was, a, it was a battle royal, I'm telling you. It was, it was very difficult because some people were more wordy than others. I was after the blanks in it and, and designed the blanks and tried to figure out which words I wanted people to write in. So we did a lot of work around that. But what we would do is we would work on the Bible study every week and then Mickey and I, more Mickey than I, would teach it on Saturday in our home. How many people got the Holy Ghost while we were writing the Bible study? Five? five or six? What was it? Yeah, while we were working on the Bible study, testing it every Saturday, and we used it, it was almost a con job. We would ask people, say, hey, we're working on a Bible study. Would you come let us teach it as a test? And people would get the Holy Ghost <laughs> on Saturday. It was really cool. It was a very, very neat experience. But we've, we're currently at 30 languages. We have 18 languages in the new format the balance of the languages were all translated and printed by missionaries around the world without permission, which I worried about that for a long time. And finally, I realized it had created a life of its own, and I just need to stop worrying about it. So it continues to propagate today in many different languages. It's in 30 languages right now. And we're currently touching, best I can tell, and I added this up today, 4.6 billion people in the world can reach the Bible study today. So... Yeah, thank you. But what we're after, I, I want to get at least six or seven billion be able to, to be able to access the Bible study if we can get, get the word out that it's out there for them. So 
uh, we're working on it diligently. This is a really neat piece of the story. This is Ukrainian, and we were asked by the mission, by, by the pastor there in Kiev about uh, four or five months ago, could we get it in the Ukrainian language? So we sent them over the English version. They did the translation, sent it back. We converted it, got it ready to go, printed a bunch of them and had them printed there in Kiev and sent them the digital version. And they launched the Bible study on the same day they launched their new sanctuary that they just rebuilt in Kiev. And I, I was told by Brother Dan McLeod that I think it's 140 people a week are coming through that new building, the new, new visitors every week, and they're teaching into his marvelous light there. So I'm, I'm really, really excited about that. And me. But let, 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 I want to make sure I say something here. I, we've never taken a penny out of Into His Marvelous Light. It's not a for-profit business. It's a non-profit thing. We have never taken a penny. The money goes back into printing more and do more translations. So we've ne- this has never been a for-profit thing ever, and it never will be. And uh, we actually want to build a bigger organization around it and just keep, keep getting more and more languages done. And this is one I'm very proud of. This is Vietnamese. Uh, I happen to have an operation in Ho Chi Minh City. One of my companies is there. And uh, I just found out we have a missionary over there. He's been over there for years, did not have into his marvelous light translated. So we got it translated and he's now fixing to get a bunch of printed versions. So some of my employees are asking about where the missionary's at that I know. So I'm hoping that I can influence some of my people to uh, move from their Vietnamese uh, Christianity to our apostolic Christianity, which is a little bit different. I won't go there. But uh, that's the Vietnamese version. And then this is the follow on study called God for Living. We did this about 10 or 12 years ago, maybe longer. How? Um, 15. I bring Mickey because everything I say really is probably not quite exactly right when it comes to years and numbers. I don't remember those well. She knows all of them. God for Living is a follow on study. And really, if you want to leave the benefits, privileges, and responsibilities of a Christian, what did I just get with a, when I got the Holy Ghost? What am I supposed to do to keep it? What does it do for me? I mean, it's just, it really, and what is baptism all about? What about the dress? All that kind of stuff. It's all in there. It's the same. It's a 12-page Bible study. It looks just like the Into His Marvelous Light. But when somebody gets the Holy Ghost and is used Into His Marvelous Light, we give them this. They take it home. It's kind of a product that they can go set and read and study and then bring it back and, and uh, speak to a mentor or someone in the church. So uh, very happy about that. And it's just for some reason, it's been out there for years. And about the last two years, it just went crazy and took off. So, so it's, it's now doing very well. So I just wanted to, I wanted to lay the foundation with the Bible study because really the Bible study was printed 1987, September and the 1980s were really a crazy window of our life. I mean, it was nuts. I'm going to tell you a little bit about it in just a second. That's part of the story. But 1987 was kind of the turning point for a lot of things in our lives. When we published the Bible study, and it was a very difficult challenge to get it published, we got it published, and there was three of us. Two of them are no longer part of the movement at all. I'm the only guy left standing out of the three that did the Bible study in our movement. And my business went to chapter 11 the next year. So, I mean, it was, it, it was like Satan attacked each one of us where we had a vulnerability. And mine was business, obviously, and boy, did he go after me. Uh, and I'm blaming it on the devil, not me as a poor businessman. How's that? Nobody laughed. So this is the 1980s. So that's, that's in my garage in like 75, right, Mickey? So I, I was trained as an illustrator, uh, a pencil illustrator at Texas Academy of Art. I talked to the school about that today. By the way, did you guys see my little pen right here? Pretty cool. I got that in my gift bag today, so I thought I'd wear it. And then that's when I had hair in 86. But uh, so the 1980s were a really transitional period of time. Um, I, I was working in the stores for Safeway, and so I'm going to start down the storyline here, and I'm going to jump because I can't tell the whole thing. But um, I was I was sacking. I started sacking groceries at 15 years old. Never got out of the grocery industry to, to speak of. And in 1980, I left Safeway stores. I ended up in the advertising department for for five years, 
and left the ad department, was with Safeway for seven, and joined the Houston Fire Department and became a pipe and ladderman on a fire truck. My brother was a district chief in the fire stations at the time in Houston, and I told him I wanted to start up a business. He said, we ought to become a fireman because all the firemen have side businesses. So I thought, well, that's a great idea because they only work nine days a month. What you forget is they work nine 24-hour days a month, and you fight fires in the middle of the night. So there was a little miscalculation on my part. <laughs> and you also almost get killed all the time, which is not good. So I made it a year in the fire station. Is that any surprise? Uh, but what happened was the first year I was in the fire station, I had an opportunity to, to do some Safeway work out of corporate and did some grand opening work for them. And this took over all of the work in the Houston division that I was doing when I was an employee. And we did a million dollars the first year in business. And so I was in the fire station making $27,000 a year salary, had health insurance, and did a million dollars in business with three of us in the office. So I'm like, probably shouldn't be in the fire department. So, so I'm going to put some numbers out there tonight that's and I hate putting these out here, but I'm going I'm to tell you because it doesn't make sense unless you see the scale of this. But what happened in 1981, we did a million. And then I did three million the next year. Then 9 million, 17, 21, 26, 34, chapter 11. <laughs> Seriously. So I went straight up. I mean, it was a crazy ride. I can't even tell you. My wife can probably show you scars from it, but it, it, was, it was literally, I've never seen anything like it. And so what happened to me, though, is I thought, you are a genius. You're absolutely the brightest guy that's ever walked the face of the earth. You know, how, you know success and money do strange things to us. I was raised in the apostolic doctrine. I was raised by very poor parents. We didn't have much. You know, and, and I, we didn't know it that we didn't have much. We lived out on a little place on a mobile home that was, the first one was eight feet by 50 feet. And there was like seven of us in it or six of us. And then they had a 12 by 60 and we thought we'd moved into a mansion. Seriously. And so that's the way we were raised. And so when I got into money, I, it was not going to affect me. I was not going to let it bother me. It was not going to, but what happens when you have that kind of crazy success, you, it does things to you. And, and so we have to be very, very aware that it can go away as fast as it comes. Because in 1986, December the 7th, I think it was, of 1986, the dollar devalued 55% in one week. Now, I had been, I thought I was really smart. And so I was hedging paper on the foreign market. So I was buying paper from Russia, from, from uh, the Volga River in Russia. I was buying paper from Sapi, South Africa, and I was buying paper from Svenska in Sweden. And so I was buying paper at about 300 bucks a ton and selling it for like $460 a ton in the U.S. under contract. In one week, the U.S. government decides after the dollar not fluctuating since Bretton Woods in 1945 had never fluctuated over 5% annually, fluctuated 55% in one week. When that happened, my margin on paper went upside down. So I was making a quarter of a million dollars a month. I mean, I was just rocking. I mean, I was making money hand over fist. It was stupid money. And I thought, boy, you are really smart. A week later... I'm sitting there looking at it going, boy, you are an idiot. And I went from genius to village idiot in about a week. And then I fought it for 87, 88, and finally went chapter 11 and 89 when they tried to seize my equipment. But I went from making 250,000 a month to losing over 350,000 a month. And so I did everything in my power to cut costs. I closed plants. I did everything I could do. And I just could not get it profitable. I mean, it was bleeding so profusely at that time that I couldn't stop it. And what happened, my contracts were written on the foreign paper price with margin. So when it flipped, though, all the domestic suppliers ran their paper prices up about 60 bucks a ton. Well, I was underwater about 100 bucks a ton out of the gate, and it kept getting worse. They raised paper prices five times in one year. I just went worse and worse and worse. So 1989, I um, uh, had, this is part of our story that, I don't like telling, but I will tell it to you because I think it's important. So in 1989, I had had a, a vendor that I bought presses from, and I'd bought more presses from Goss Community 
and Rockwell International in three years and anybody had bought in their history more units. So I was very close to them and they liked me a lot, of, of course, because I'm buying their equipment. But I got, they never finance equipment. They get somebody like Ford Motor Credit or Ingersoll Rand or somebody like that to do the financing on this iron. So Ford Motor Credit had financed a bunch of our, our, of our presses, about $7 million in this one press. And uh, they sent out a collection company out of New York and these were mean people. I don't know if you've ever dealt with collectors from New York when you owe somebody seven million. These are not nice people. So they came, they came out to the office and they said, you know, we're gonna have to seize the press. We're gonna take possession of the press and come get it. And I said, what would it take to keep you from taking possession of the press? I need the press to stay in business. And they said, they said you would have to give us at least $140,000 cash today, which was a payment that I owed that I didn't make. So I wrote a $140,000 check, which I did not need to write because I didn't need them to take the press. So they agreed not to seize my press if I would go another month. And one week later, my brother called me on a Tuesday afternoon and he said, Galen, there's three tractor trailer trucks backed up to our dock, men in coveralls, they've got generators, they've got, they've got jackhammers, they've got big tools, they've got lots of people. And I asked them what they were here for and they said, they're coming to take the press. These guys would take my 140,000 and was still gonna take the press. They had no intention of, of leaving that press there. So I told my brother, I said, I said, let me think about it for a few minutes. So I hung up the phone, I'll never forget. I sat in my office, I was there by myself. I called him back and I said, you think we can dismantle that press overnight? Now this press is 140 feet long, weighs hundreds of tons. <laughs> it's a massive piece of equipment. Have you ever seen a big web printing press? Have y'all ever seen these presses? They print newspapers. These are big presses. These are 100 horsepower motors on every unit. These are big electric motors. So I said, do you think we could dismantle it and move it tonight? And he's like, well, I don't know why not. I mean, my brother, you'd have to know Lowell. He's, he's a character. And uh, he said, he's a Houston Fire Department district chief. And so firemen do everything, right? So I said, can you call some firemen and see if we can get them out there? So I, he said, I'll call the fire department. You call John Chancellor and get these guys out of here. So John Chancellor, probably shouldn't put this out in public. This is being live streamed. <laughs> Sorry, John. He was the police chief of a small police department right there near my office. So I called him, he had done security for us. And I said, John, I don't know what to do. These guys are trying to seize my press. Do you have any ideas? And he said, let me see what I can do. Well, it's not but a few minutes later, my brother calls me. He said, you got to get over here. I said, why? He said, man, there's cops everywhere. I get over there. There's Department of Public Safety. There's Houston police officers. They've got these guys all lined up. They're getting them for trespassing. And I'm like, holy cow, it does matter who you know. So they lined these guys up, bless their hearts, and told them they had to get their tr trucks off our property and they had to go get a writ of seizure. Now it's 4.30 in the afternoon, it's too late for them to get a writ of seizure. So I knew, I called my attorneys and I said, we're in trouble. They're getting a writ of seizure in the morning. He said, we gotta beat them to the courthouse and we gotta file a chapter 11 before they file a writ of seizure. Because in Texas, possession is nine tenths of the law. So if you can get possession of that press, you can keep it. And I said, what time do I need to be down there? He said, meet me down there at 6.30 in the morning. So I said, oh, the courthouse opened at eight. So we're lined up at 6.30 in the morning. Now that night though, I called her and I said, uh, I don't want you to stay in the house. I don't know what's gonna happen. We're fixing to have to do something crazy. So I'm gonna come get you and the girls and take y'all up to Somerville Lake and take the pop-up trailer up there. And I think it was a pop-up at that time. So I took the pop-up camper and took her and the kids up to Somerville while they're over there dismantling the press. I set them up in the tent and I hightailed it back to Texas, back to Houston. So I could get ready for the chapter 11 the next morning. So I go back to study and try to figure out what I need to get ready for chapter 11, called all the attorneys, got everybody lined up. So this is a great part of the story. So the next morning, so I'm talking to my brother all night and of course he's like, don't call me, I'm busy, you know. So we're waiting for them to see if they could get this press out of this building. So I'm standing in line at 6.30 the next morning down at the courthouse ready to file this chapter 11. And my brother calls me and he's tired, I can tell. They're just exhausted. He goes, hey. I said, yeah. He said, where are you? I said, I'm at the courthouse, where are you? I'm on 610 loop. I said, all right. He said, where do I take these presses? I said, I don't know. Go in a circle till I call you. <laughs> so, so they drove these four tractor trailer trucks around 610 loop all morning. 
So I filed chapter 11, but while I'm standing in line, I mean, it, it, so is the Lord in all this? I, you know, I can tell you some stories that something happened. But I'm standing in line, and we're like four people ahead of us, and we're at the front of the line, and about two people behind me, a guy walks up with his little briefcase, and my attorney turns around and looks at me, and he goes, that's Ford Motor Credit's attorney of Baker Botts right there. He just came up behind. He said, I want to introduce you to him. So he said, hey, John, or whatever his name was, and he said, this is Galen with, with Adplex. And the guy goes, oh, God, no. No, you beat me to it. He said, yeah. He said, well, call me when you guys get it filed. Let's see what we can do. So he just turns around and leaves. So we get the chapter 11 filed. I called a guy named Andy Billup that was in the real estate business that had tried to lease me a building one time. And I called Andy and I said, hey, Andy, do you have any buildings available? And he's like, well, I mean, we could line up something to show you here. I said, no, I'm, I'm talking about like right now. He said, what do you need? I said, I need about 50,000 feet. I've got a press I need to unload. We're driving it around the loop right now. I'll tell you about it later. <laughs> and he said, is it just on its way in? I said, yes, sir, it's on its way in. <laughs> he said, you know, I have one over on Airtex. This is the stupidest thing I've ever done in my life. I have one over on Airtex. He said, it's right there at the corner of Airtex and uh, Jotero Boulevard or whatever that was over there. And he said, it's filthy. He said, it was a machine shop. It's got oil everywhere. It needs a lot of work. I'd have to go over and do some cleanup on it and stuff like that. And I said, do you have any keys to it? He said, well, yeah, you want me to open it up so they can look at it? I said, I want you to open it up so we can unload in it. And he said, you want to talk about the lease? I said, yeah, how much is it? He says, 21 cents a foot. I said, taken, I'm done. I said, now I'm going to call my brother and have him take the presses over there and unload them. So I'd never even seen this building. And we unloaded those presses in that building. The building was wonderful. It actually worked out to be a perfect space for us. And we stayed there for a number of years. But that, that is my story about chapter 11 that is a disaster for most people. But the, it ended up being a, a wonderful, it ended up well. We ended up keeping the press. Ford Motor Credit worked with us, uh, let us uh, pay them off over time. But I'll have to tell you the, the rest of that story. So chapter 11 we get to uh, the end of it. And so you go through about a year of reorganization. You got a trustee. There's all kinds of things that happened during that time. But I had made a pledge to uh, a, a missionary that went to France. He had been my piano teacher uh, when I was about nine years old, not maybe 11. Anyway, it doesn't matter because I never studied one time. I couldn't tell you where C's at on the piano today. But my mother made me take piano lessons. He cried at several piano lessons during that time. But he ended up being a missionary and going on the field. But I was making all that money, and I told him one night at the altar, I said, if you ever need anything, call me. Uh, I'll be glad to take care of it and help you. So sure enough, uh, I'm in the middle of this trustee-run operation uh, in the middle of 1990, and I get this phone call from this missionary, and he says, Galen, I'm in trouble. It's 3 o'clock on a Sunday morning. He said, I'm in trouble. He said, I need 8700 bucks." My wife's parents are dying. One died about four months ago. We used all of our credit cards to get them home. Now the mother's died. My wife's got to get home. We have no credit. We got to buy plane tickets, all this. And he said, I can't get any money. I don't know where to get it from. And I said, I'll take care of it. I, I didn't have anything. I had no way to get money and I had no money. So I thought, well, I had a clever idea though. I'm pretty creative. So I thought, well, I'll go to my pastor in the morning and get him to take up an offering. So I've got this solved. So my pastor, it was Ron Macy at the time, and uh, so I, I, and we'd known each other our whole lives, and we learned to swim at four years old together, so we, we've really been close. So I go to him on Sunday morning, and I said, hey, I need, he knocked on his door, he said, hey, come in. I said, I got a problem. This missionary, and he knows him. They sponsored him. I said, he needs 8,700 bucks. I told him that I would get you to take up an offering today, and uh, we would send it to him tomorrow. And he said, yeah, I'd be glad to do that. And I said, I'll, I'll make up what it's, whatever we don't get. Well, I'm thinking he's going to get seven or $8,000, you know, and I'll throw in 700 bucks and be done with it. And uh, so he gets up to take up the offering. And, you know, you need to do an appeal when you're trying to get a lot of money. You don't need to just brush it off. He got up and said, the ushers come up, take up the offering. Oh, by the way, brother so-and-so needs an offering. Y'all throw in some extra money for him kind of thing. And that was it. He's turned and walked off, and I'm lying on the front row going, no, 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 you need to make an appeal. I have no money. So he doesn't make an appeal. They got about, how much did they get? 3,500 or something like that. I had to put in like 5,000. 
And it was like, oh, no, where am I going to get 5000 from? So I told him I would send it to him. So Monday morning, I go in the office. I've got this check from the church for about a third of it. And I'm sitting at my desk thinking, what in the world do I do? How do I get this money to this missionary? I promised him I would do it. So I just went down to accounting, and I have a trustee that's keeping me from writing any checks. But I went to accounting, and I said, give me a check. So the girl worked for me for a number of years, a long, long time. And she said, Galen, I said, give me a check. She gave me a check, and I went down and wrote it for the balance and gave it to my assistant, said, take these two checks down to Western Union, wire the money to the missionary. So she did. And I knew if the trustee found out about it, I was going to be in big trouble. I mean, it was way outside the bounds of what you should be doing with a trustee that's supposed to approve all the expenditures because you got he's, he's representing all the creditors. So long story short, the next day, I'm sitting at my desk about 9 o'clock in the morning. The phone rings, and it's a guy named Doug Simpkins. And Doug, half owned the, he owned half of the building that I was sitting in. I owned the other half. And he said, Galen, I've got some interesting news. I said, what? He said, we had been paying this property tax bill. And he said, we way overpaid the property tax for the wrong district. We just found out they're going to refund the portion of the property tax back to us that we've been paying for the last three years. we are going to pay it back over 12 months. He said, your check that's sitting here on my desk, y'all, it was to the penny of the check I wrote. Let me tell you so. He said, he said, and you're going to get one every month for 12 months. <laughs> and all I could think at that moment was I cheated myself out of $3,000 a month <laughs> by getting my pastor to take up an offering. <laughs> a lesson learned. Don't do that. Oh my goodness, so many things happened during that, those years, but we had confirmation after confirmation that we were doing the right thing by, by sticking with it. And I could have shut it down at any moment. And I would have been better off many times closing it and getting out, because it was just a bloodbath. It was horrible. I laid off 380 people in one day, and I talked to every one of them in one day. I mean, it broke my heart. It just killed me. I can't stand that. I hate laying people off. But... It, it's part of what you have to do when you run companies, especially when you uh, run into a situation like we did. But in the middle of all that, we, we just had wonderful things happen. My pastor, uh, on Sunday, I said, would you come out to my office? Because I mean, we, we were at a point where we couldn't make payroll. I mean, it just got really ugly. And I said, would you come out and talk to my guys and just give us some hope? And he said, yeah, I'll be glad that I'll come out Tuesday morning. Well, Monday night... I'm at the house, and, and a call came to the house. This was before cell phones, obviously. And I think we still had crank phones, something like that. But a uh, call came in, and it was a guy named John Markey with Gannett. And I've known John. Uh, he was a, the guy that ran Gannett newspapers and ran USA Today. And we'd done the color separations on some of the early days of the USA Today newspaper to try to help them balance color. And uh, he, I mean, he, he wasn't a religious guy at all, in fact, quite the opposite. And uh, he said, Galen, uh, how are you? And I said, I'm fine. I wasn't fine, but I said, you know how we do that. I'm fine. Oh, I'm fine. How are you? I'm doing fine. He said, I was trying to go to sleep and I keep having this thing come over and over and over to me. And I had to call and tell you this story. I don't know why I'm telling you, but he said, I was in the Sea of Japan in the, in the Navy. We were on a destroyer and we got in a typhoon and my captain told us to all get down below the deck and he's batting the hatches down, and we turned the nose of the ship into the storm, and we went full steam ahead into the storm. And he said, that's what I'm supposed to tell you. I don't know why. He said, I hope everything goes well. Clunk, hung up. Well, I'm like, is there more to this story? <laughs> so I'm like, well, that's the weirdest thing that ever happened. And he, he never called me. I mean, it wasn't like we had a, a constant conversation. The man never called. I did one project for him. The next morning, Ron Macy comes to my office to tell a story, or to talk to us, and he tells the story of David and the pit. It was dark, man. It was not the story I wanted to hear at that moment. He's talking about the pit and, you know, getting to the palace, and I'm like, oh, if I could just see the palace and get out of the pit, that would be great. And then right at the end of the thing, he says, you know what? He said, I want to, before I leave, he said, I want to tell you all something. He said, I was reading in Reader's Digest yesterday, and I read this story about this little bird in Alaska. And it's the only bird that doesn't migrate. And he said, during the winter months, he puts his claws into the branches and leans forward. And he's got these little shutters on his eyes. And he puts his beak into the storm and rides these blizzards out with his beak in the storm. And I was like, okay, God, (laughs) 
I'm supposed to go through this. this is, there's a purpose in this. And that was the moment that, that it dawned on me that God can use these types of events and these types of circumstances to teach us. And then I started asking myself, what am I supposed to be learning about this? What, what is it about this? Instead, of, I, I went literally in two days from being the victim to a victor. Saying, how do, I, how, do I, how do I learn from this? What am I supposed to do with this? And it, we just kept getting confirmations and kept getting confirmation. People would come up that don't know us and say, I was praying. The Lord told me to tell you everything's going to be all right. And I, one pastor that I'd never met, didn't know anything we were going through, told us that. And we were like, okay, good. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. So we came out of chapter 11 in December of 1990. And the reason we got out we had one big creditor that did not want us out and they didn't like it that we, would, we were trying to get out. And our plan called for me to take 51% of the company, all the creditors get 49%, and then I would have three years to buy back the stock that they got in the company at fair market value. And so we got, we got to the courthouse that morning and they had told my attorney, they had contacted my attorney and said, we're not gonna vote positive in this and we're gonna take the company and liquidate it. So you can imagine, I didn't sleep a wink. I mean, I just was up days. Uh, I was younger then, and uh, I, I could still function. I went to the courthouse. I was sitting there at the table, just distraught, because I just knew that this was it. You know, they were going to come in and tell the judge they were not in favor of the, and they were the largest single creditor, the largest single creditor. They had control of the, of the, the vote, basically, at this point. So I'm sitting there at the table and our court, tape, court time was 9 a.m. And so 9 a.m. comes and goes and their table's empty. And I'm like, oh, they're gonna come marching in here with a whole contingency in just a second, you know? So my brain's just on high, you know, just spinning out of control. 9, 5, 9, 5, 9, 10, 9, 15, there's nobody at the table. And I'm like, I'm looking around and everybody else is looking around the judge is getting pretty upset. So I see the judge, he calls his court clerk over and he says, rrr, 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 and she takes off and goes in the back room. And then a the minute she comes out and rrr, 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 to him. So we're just sitting there thinking, what in the world's going on? And he said, Mr. Walters, come up here. I walked up there and he takes his hammer and he just on the thing. And he said, we're going to accept your plan. He said, Baker Botts is scheduled for tomorrow, not today. True story. So the Lord <laughs> manipulated some secretary somewhere to put the wrong day on the calendar <laughs> for their court date. <laughs> and we got the company back and I bought it back. We were at, now we were at 34 million, 36 million when we went in chapter 11. It dropped to 15 million over a year. I lost Kroger, I lost Albertsons, I lost Kroger Dallas, I lost Albertsons, and I lost one more. I lost two Safeway divisions. And when we came out of chapter 11, I sold Randall's two weeks before we came out of chapter 11. And while I was in chapter 11, I sold Randall's supermarkets and convinced them that we were going to come out. And we did. We came out. But we went from 15 million to 70 million in four years. <laughs> yeah. So it was a... You know, I thought it was a rocket ship ride to get to 36, and then we go down to 15 and go through three years of just hysteria, and then we went to 70 million in, in our fourth year. And it was an unbelievable ride. And, and what we learn, though, out of the chapter 11, you, know, you, you, you find out what you don't know. And so the biggest lessons we had then during that time were really around finance and accounting and cash flow management and a lot of those kinds of things that, that we were not that astute in before. I had never had a CFO. I had never had a line of credit with a bank. I collected money at $30 million a, a year. I was collecting money from my credit, my, my customers and paying payroll. I did not have a line of credit at 30 million. So you learn a lot as you go through. I'm an artist. I came out of an illustration school and got out. You know, it was horrible. I barely made through. I was telling these kids today, I barely made through high school. Barely, seriously. In fact, they let me out to get me out. You know, it was kind of like, I went down to the, to the principal actually and said, am I going to be able to get out? He said, you're, you're, you're getting out of here. <laughs> we don't want you here anymore. So that's how I got out of high school. So the 80s were just a phenomenal 
ride. And the Lord just showed us so much and did so many miracles for us. And, and you know, you, you just hear this whole time, I'm in the back of my mind, thought I was being called to preach. So I was always, I felt, I felt guilty that I was in business the whole time. And in 2017, I'll just jump forward for a little bit for a second. In 2017, I met Terry Schock, uh, he came out of uh, POA. And Terry and I ended up connecting through a conference and uh, we decided to do Kingdom Leader Lab together. So we developed this Kingdom Leader Lab. He came to the farm, we were sitting there talking and, and uh, he, said, he said, do you feel like you were called to preach? And I said, no, I wasn't. He said, no, you wasn't. And he said, the Lord told me to tell you you were called to business. And I'm like, man, where have you been for the last 30 years? I mean, it sure would have taken a load off me. But I, I never, I came up in an era, think about this, I came up in an era where ministry was only in the pulpit. I mean, I'm 70, okay? So, but when I was a boy, you weren't in ministry unless you were a preacher. So I didn't, I didn't know there was a ministry in business. Nobody ever taught me that. So when I look at what this church has done through business, I'm just blown away. I mean, the foresight that your bishop had to, to cultivate and nurture business people in the church is just remarkable. I mean, it is remarkable. And, and let me, so I, I think it, it's, it's kind of, it would be easy to take that for granted, but it's so unusual. <laughs> I mean, my entire life has been like this. My whole life, they wanted you in the church because you had money, but they didn't want you saying anything because they didn't want business to interrupt or business to come into the, to the movement. To see this balanced is just such a beautiful thing to me. I'm just blown away by it. So I, I don't even know what else to say about that other than I am so in honor of what you've built and I see the edifice that it's created and, and there's no question in my mind how this happened. As I watch what you guys have done and what he's cultivated here, it just makes all the sense in the world that you've been able to build what you've built here and have what you have and be the beacon of light that you are to this city. And actually to everybody that drives down this highway out here because I've wondered about you guys for years and didn't know anything about you, so I'm glad I'm here. So let me talk about where it's jumped to. So. I sold that business in, in um, 2000 and I was, in, I was printing newsprint circulars for the newspapers, for, for the retailers. So you know these ads that you get in the mail that you throw away and you put in the bottom of bird cages and that kind of stuff? I did that. I cut down trees and made those. So we had seven printing plants around the country. We grew it to 136 million in sales and 1,000 employees. And I ran that beast. Uh, it, was, it was a bear. But sold, I had a company come along and want to buy it. And I thought, well, circulars are dying anyway. I'm getting out of here. So I said, yes, I'll sell it. And then 9-11 happened. We had the money lined up. Everything was ready to go. I was going to leave and go get a motor home and drive around. Uh, and they were going to run the company. And 9-11 happens. It puts the brakes on everything. The deal's off. And I'm devastated. In January after 9-11, they called back and said, okay, we think we can raise the capital now, but you have to go on a road show and raise the capital for us. So I went on the road show and did all the capital raise. These people were too old to do it. One of them was 70 and one was like, one was 65 and one was like 112 or something like that. I don't know, he was too old, but he was, he was very old. I ate something out of a paper sack. I never could figure out what he was eating, but he, he carried a paper sack around, dug around in it and ate it all the time. And every board meeting he ate out of that paper sack. I, I, I think it was cocaine or something. I don't know what, <laughs> something was keeping him alive. They ended up, we ended up getting the money for the company. I'm still leaving. They're taking the company over in January of 2002, uh, 2003. It took me all of 2002 to get it closed. And uh, I'm leaving, got some cash. I'm happy. Everything's great. I get a phone call 30 days before the deal closed. And they said, come to New York. I went to New York and I thought it was a celebration dinner or something. They took me to Spark Steakhouse. That's where the, the gaudy guy killed the other guy in the, you know, in the restaurant. I didn't know that until I walked in. I hear about it, so I'm like, great, glad I'm here. 
So I go in and uh, we spend dinner talking about Range Rovers and beach houses and airplanes. And I'm thinking, what, what am I here? So finally I asked the guy, Mark Monaco, I said, Mark, why am I here? I mean, what, what are we doing? And he said, oh yeah. He reached in his pocket and pulls out a piece of paper. It's an art chart. And he said, well, we're going to make this one guy, the chairman, that his brother is going to be the president and you're going to be the CEO and run the company. Or we're not doing the deal. The deal's off. Now, I don't know if you've ever sold a company, but once you've tried for a year to get it sold and you've tried to raise money and you've gone through this roller coaster of raising money and you're 30 days away from closing the deal, you're done. As I used to say, monkey's dead, show's over. I mean, you're, you, you don't want anything else to do with this. You're done. You're out. You're gone. You're mentally gone. Physically, you're resigned to leaving. And they said, you got to stay and run it. So I went through a kind of a emotional roller coaster for about 30 minutes at the table with them thinking, no, I can't, I'm buying a motor home and going to drive around Canada or something. You know, I, I've got plans. So I said, let me go outside and call my wife and let me talk to her. So I go outside and call Mickey, never forget this conversation, very brief. I said, I've got bad news. And she said, what? I said, they're going to buy the company, but they want me to stay and run it. And she says, what were you going to do anyway? Why wouldn't you stay and run it? What are they going to pay you? I said, they're going to pay me a half a million. She said, why wouldn't you stay and do that? I said, okay, never mind. I'll call you back. <laughs> Went back in, sat down, said, I'm in. But I have to have a Range Rover. I did that, actually. I said, I'll do it under one condition. I want, to, I want the company to buy me a brand new Range Rover. And they said, done. Buy yourself a Range Rover. So the company bought me a Range Rover. And I, 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 stayed, I signed a three-year contract. I stayed five years. And I left in 07. And I was going to buy a motorhome when I left and go drive around. It's my second try at the motorhome. So I'm going to, I'm, I leave in 07. I'm out. I'm done. I go home, tell everybody bye, send out an email to all my customers all these years and said, I'm done. It's over with. And I get a phone call from one of my customers and he said, what in the world are you doing? And I said, well, I, I'm done. I'm at the end of my five years and they're going to run the company and I'm going to be gone. He said, who's going to take care of us? And I said, well, they're going to take care of it. He said, they're not going to take care of us. He said, I want you to take our business somewhere else. And I said, well, we'll talk about that. And he said, and I want you to come over here and, and help us. And I said, well, I, I don't want to do that. I'm going to take off the next three months and buy a motor home. We're going to drive around the country. And he said, I'll send you a hundred thousand dollars. I'll wire it over to you. I need you to come over here next week. And I said, what time are we starting? <laughs> So I never bought the motorhome. I still haven't bought a motorhome. So I'm waiting for the next deal. And maybe we'll buy a motorhome. But I actually named that company that night. And we got a phone call the next morning. And a guy named Kerry Attar that um, was with HEB stores wanted to open a restaurant. Wanted to open a store and a restaurant called Hubble and Hudson on the, in the Woodlands on the waterway. And he called me and he said, I'm bringing the contract over to your company to sign right now. And I said, Take it to them. I'm no longer there. And he said, where are you? I said, I'm at home. He said, what's your home address? I said, no, no, no. You have to take it to them. He said, Galen, what's your home address? I tell him. He said, I'm on my way there. So he walks in, takes a pen, writes through my company name, puts my name. He said, you're doing the job. So we ended up replacing my entire salary plus the three people that I brought in salaries in four days with contracts. So we were back in business in the consulting side of the world in four days with contracts, it was craziness. So I've started up a lot of companies and been able to ride this grocery wave now for a long time. So that was in 07. In 11, I got a phone call. And in 2000, go back a little bit, 2000, I built a piece of software. It was the first time I did software. And I did it for a company called Del Hayes. They own Foodline and Hannaford Brothers up on the East Coast. They have about 1,500 stores. And uh, we had built this first virtual store that anybody had built at that time. And it was an online store for them. And uh, never written software, never done anything in software. They said, can you do it? I said, sure. So I went and found out how to do it. And we hired the people to do it. And we did it. And we got it live in just a few months. And it was, it was wonderful. It was a great ride. But when I left the company, they wouldn't let me take it. So I had five years non-compete. So I waited till 2011 phone call came. Can you build the software for us again? Can you rebuild it? Cause we hate these people. They, we don't like them. And I said, yeah, I'll rebuild it. So the guy that helped me build it, that was at Adplex, 
had gone to Vietnam and set up a shop. So I called him, Lun Nguyen, and he'd been working for me since he was 20. And Vietnamese boy, very bright, couple degrees, brilliant mind. And I said, can you help us build this thing? He said, yes. So we built United Supermarkets Virtual Store over, called it Relation Shop in 2011. So it just, it just is, it was incredible. So we ended up building out data science, building out this whole model, and was doing all of the customer engagement work for supermarkets with software. And that started growing really fast. So it kind of took us over and consulting went aside and software took off. So in 2019, he came to me and said, I'm gonna sell my company in Vietnam. I said, you can't sell it, I'm your customer. I'm the only customer. And he said, well, somebody wants to buy it. I said, you're not selling it to them. I'm either gonna move the business somewhere else or I'll buy it. So he said, well, then you buy it and I'll go to work for you. So we ended up buying it with equity. And, and so we picked up the Vietnamese development company. He owned half the code, I owned half the code. I got all the code back, got a bunch of new products they had developed back. And, and that was in 2019. COVID happens in 20, disaster. Retail goes on a spiral. I mean, they could not handle the e-commerce load that they had. You can only imagine when people couldn't go to the stores, didn't want to go to the stores, scared to go to the stores. They started shopping online. Well, nobody was ready for that. It was kind of like churches weren't ready to not have service. The same panic that happened in churches happened in retail. And so we got a, you just got ground down. I mean, it was horrible, but it was wonderful. We made more money in 2020. So we like pandemics. <laughs> it was good for us. But we, we built out a brand new set of tools, uh, built out our own data science team in, in 2020. Uh, it really went on steroids and took off. And so we realized, though, that things had changed so substantially in retail in that period of time during COVID in 20 and 21 that we had to, we had to shift gears. And I either needed to eat or be eaten. Does that make sense to you? We either had to grow or somebody was going to gobble us up. And I didn't want to be gobbled up at the time because my valuations were not where they needed to be. So because we were too small. And private equity guys kept telling us, you got to grow it. You got to get bigger. You got to get your margins different. You got to get, you know, on and on and on. You always got all the advice you want. So I realized I had to grow it. So in 22, I, I moved one of my guys to president. I went out and started talking to private equity, started trying to raise capital, looking around, trying to figure out what to do. I'm in a trade show in uh, Las Vegas, and I had just partnered with a company in Israel called Store.ai on a project, and we were going to integrate our software with theirs and do a project for United Supermarkets in Lubbock as a test. And I'm, I've decided to go to the trade show at the very last minute. Uh, it was the first trade show humans could go to again. You know, you had to wear a mask, but still we could go to a trade show. And uh, people are shaking their head, you know, like mask over here. Huh? Uh, but so I go to the trade show at the very last minute. I decide on Monday night to go, and it started Tuesday morning. And I told Mickey, I said, I feel like I need to go to the trade show. So I show up at the trade show. My team doesn't know I'm coming. I go buy my way in with a $1,200 ticket, get on the floor of the trade show. I'm there 30 minutes, and the guy walks up, and he says, are you Galen? I said, yeah. He said, hey, my boss just showed up. We didn't know he was coming from Israel. He's here. He said, I would like for you to meet him. And I said, well, bring him over. So he brings him around. Come to find out, he didn't know he was going until the last minute, decides he's going to go from Israel. You know, two days before, buys a ticket and comes over, doesn't tell his team, surprises them. So I surprised my team. He surprised his team. He walks up and he says, he says, how large are you? And I tell him, he said, we're exactly the same revenue. He said, how many employees do you have? And I tell him, we have the same number of employees. I said, how many customers do you have? He said, I have 318. He said, how many do you have? I said, I have three. He's like, wow, what do you do? So I told him what I'm doing. And he said, why don't you have more customers? I said, I haven't needed more customers. I make a lot of money doing what I do with three. So why would I, I have a lifestyle business? But I said, I am interested in growing it. He said, would you like to merge? I said, yes. He said, would you do a 50-50 deal? I said, probably. I said, let's talk. So we talked all day that day, back and forth. It was kind of odd. And they're Orthodox Jews um, and uh, wonderful people. And uh, a lot has transpired in that world for me. But uh, I get a phone call four days later from his dad in Montreal. And he's a, he's a rabbi. And he called and he said, I hear my boy's telling me I'm supposed to be talking to you. And I said, yeah. I said, well, we just ran each other and thought maybe we should be looking at putting these companies together. And he said, you want to do it? 
I said, well, yeah, I mean, I'm interested in doing it. He said, well, then let's do it. And I said, well, don't you have a board and all that? She said, nah, I'm the venture capitalist that funded all the money in it anyway. I've put 27 million in. Let's just put these two companies together. He said, you want to run it? I said, yeah, we need to talk. I said, we, we, I'm not ready to do this yet. So we met, I, I flew to Israel the next week, me and three of my guys, me and two of my guys, three of us, we went over there the next week, met them in a matter of a day, figured out that we should put the two companies together. And we ended up buying their company for equity. So I ended up with a company in Tel Aviv that has 93% of all the e-commerce in Israel. 93% of all e-commerce in Israel. Plus Kuwait, yeah, it's crazy. We have one of the largest retailers in Kuwait. We have a large retailer in England called East of England, and we have one in France. So we picked up a global presence by doing that. So I expand my Vietnam team. My Vietnam team at that time had 43 in it. Today I'm 108 in Vietnam. And, and uh, it's, it's amazing. It's an arbitrage of labor uh, when you go offshore for labor. But the neat thing about it is we put these, we sent some of these guys back from our old company back there and, and repatriated three families back in 2008, Lund did, and sent them back over there and started up a software shop. So they used to work for me at Adplex. So it ends up being guys that we had known forever are sitting over there building out a software shop in Vietnam. I bought it in 2019. We've now got 108 people there. But it's 20 cents for a dollar U.S. It cost me 20 cents for the same labor dollar there. All right, so there's, a, there's an 80% 80, 80 arbitrage of labor, basically. So Canada is even worse priced. And Vietnam, I mean, it, uh, uh, Israel's even worse. So we took out 18 out of Macedonia, replaced those jobs with Vietnam, took out some in Israel, replaced those. We just took 80 jobs out of Canada because what happened, so I went ahead of myself. I shouldn't have said that. I'm off, off storyline here. But so that's in January of 23. I take over the company in Israel, and uh, it had never made money. It had lost $3 million a year for 12 years. We broke it even in August. Yeah, we broke it even in August. First time they'd ever made money, we broke it even in August. So that's pretty cool. And then, though, in July, I'm talking to Piper Sandler, the 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 uh, investment bankers, and I said, we really need to get regional retail growing in the U.S. We got to buy somebody still. I'm not big enough because we're going to get swamped. And he said, you want to talk to X? And I said, yeah, I'll talk to them. So we get, we get permission to talk to them. They want to talk. They're arrogant. They're, they're crazy people. If y'all are listening to me, you'll know who you are. Uh, but th it's not, not a fun bunch of people to work with. And so I just couldn't do it. And I told him, I said, I'm not going to work with them. I just can't. I've got to like people we work with. I can't stand to have a fight every day. I'm not going to do this. So they said, what about this company in Canada called Mercatus? And I said, well, I know them really well, but I said, they're privately held and I doubt they would ever sell. They're kind of a, a lot of panache. You know, they're, they're a very nice company. And I said, I'll call them and talk to them. So I called and I didn't know the story. The father that had run that business for many years had put a whole lot of money in the business every year. And, uh, kind of was his hobby because he also owned a very large mutual fund, one of the largest in Canada, a uh, major company. But he had put this money in this company almost as a hobby uh, investment. And uh, he passed away two years ago. The two kids own the company now and didn't want to put this money in anymore. And he told me when I called the guy that ran the company, he said, you're not going to believe this. He said, they just decided to do something with the company for the first time ever. He said, when can you come up here? I said, I would work for you. <laughs> I said, let me get up there as quick as I can. I went up the next week, and within a week, we had a deal on the table. I did that with equity as well. And we ended up with 13 regional retailers in the United States, 2,200 stores under management now in the U.S., and we did that without any capital. So I didn't put any capital in either company. So what's happened is there's just been a miraculous thing happen over and over now for us to grow this business. And today we're number two behind Instacart. Instacart is the big guys in the business and we're tied for number two. There's two of us tied. And the other one that I'm tied with is the guys that I was trying to buy that uh, I don't like. So we, we will end up buying them one of these days. But it, it's just amazing what's happened and how this has all come around. So I wanna end this 
with, with a quick story here that's a different story. So I want to go back to 2010 and 2012 because I think this is, this is if you've paid attention to anything, pay attention to this. So in 2010, my wife and I were talking and, and I said, I need to study more. I've got to, I've got to find a way to get into the word more and study. I said, I think we're going to take, I'm going to take evenings and start studying in my office if you don't mind. She said, that's fine. I'll study too. I'll study in here. You study in there. And so we'll take our evenings and start studying. And we, we've taught Sunday school our entire lives, just about since we got married, 48 years. I think we've taught Sunday school all but three or four of those years. And uh, so I taught young marriage. I had a very large young marriage class and loved teaching it and mentored those couples and, you know, how you get kind of bonded with them and all that, but the material you had to create. So I needed to study more. I mean, you, you, you just, it's like, it's, it's an insatiable appetite these kids had. And so we just needed more material and better material. I need to study more. But I was, I started praying for revelation. I asked the Lord to, to give me revelation in 2010 and I prayed for revelation for two years and, uh, just didn't, wasn't seeing anything in the word. I mean, I was seeing other people's revelations and I would, you know, hear their preach, hear them preach and hear what they said about the word and be, oh yeah, that's amazing. But I just wasn't seeing it for myself. And I, I, it was very frustrating. I've been in this my whole life. So, you know, you just think that you're going to see something in the word wasn't happening. But in 2010, I, I stumbled onto the six day war in Israel as a and I'm a kind of, I love history and kind of fascinated by what's happened over there. And this is before I had any aspiration of any business ever in Israel. And so I start looking for a way to learn more about the Jews. And I found a group called Root Source out of Hebron. And they had an online course curriculum that was 300 and something bucks a year. And you could take three courses a month or something like that. So I signed up and tried to figure out what it was. And it was actually video courses, 30 minutes each. And so I started taking as many as they would let me take. And it was, it was Jewish rabbis teaching Christians about how they pray, how women are treated in the church, about the Muslims, about, I mean, just every, about the countries around Israel, about the temple. I mean, it was just all kinds of courses. So I just started devouring this material. I took 87 of these courses over a year and a half. And so I finally get a phone call from this rabbi that runs it. And he said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm, I'm trying to learn, but you won't let me take so many courses a month. I said, I need more courses. So they upped more courses and I ended up taking, I ended up with 87 of them, but ended up on their advisory board uh, at one point. And, uh, but I couldn't figure out, I mean, it was an amazing journey and a great education but I learned about the Talmud and, and learned about the Tanakh and, and uh, just a lot about the ways they think and about the way they believe and, and how rabbis have control over their congregations and they can direct them in the way they think that the word means and the Torah means. And so you just learn a lot, right? No idea why I'm learning all this until 2023. And I walk in to a group of Orthodox Jews and they start trying to tell me about Judaism and I'm, I'm, I'm listening. So we go on a whiteboard in the room and they're gonna draw it all out for me. So while they were going to get coffee, I drew it all out for them. And when he came back in the room, he looked, he said, who did that? I said, I did it. And he said, you've been looking on Google? I said, no, I took a bunch of courses from this group in Hebron in 2010. But I said, I didn't know why I took them. But now I know why I took them. The Lord had orchestrated the whole thing. And so there's, there's a whole lot about 1967 and the war and a lot that happened there, and I won't go into that. But so 2012 comes, I'm praying for revelation, I'm studying about these Jews, and I'm just, just, just completely consumed by it. And Mickey calls me, and she's at the farm one day, and she said, Galen, um, I was outside working, and the Lord told me to get a piece of paper, I need to write something down, he wanted to tell me something for you. I think you said it was for me. And so I said, well, tell me about it. She's crying. She, Mickey's not a big crier. She doesn't, she's not emotional in that way. She don't call me crying all the time. It was a very unusual moment. And so she reads this thing to me and, and I won't read it to you, but uh, it, it just starts off by saying, I've called you for this time. I'll use you to lead people, blah, blah, blah. It goes on, talks about Moses in it. And I'm like, whoa, come on. What in the world? And so it says, you can trust in me and obey my calling on your life. 
I'm your God. I know the plans I have for you. Don't be afraid. You cannot trust yourself, but you can trust in me. Uh, and then he tells Mickey that he will confirm this word that weekend at Brother Rick Treese's church in Lake Charles, Louisiana. We had to be over there for an event. So we're going to go over there anyway. So I'm like, ah, uh, why would the Lord tell her that? And why would he tell her something for me when he could talk to me directly? <laughs> Any men in the room? You know, and I'm like, why would he talk to my wife? Why would he have to talk to my wife? That's craziness. So we go over to Lake Charles, and I'll make this quick. Uh, the quartet sings all Sunday morning. He doesn't say a word. I'm like, well, one, one strike, it's down. So that night, quartet sings again, and then he turns the service over to Brother Kelly Patrick to preach, and he goes and sits down. And I thought, well, he's not going to say anything, so there's, that wasn't the Lord. That was, you know something else. I don't know what it was, but it wasn't the Lord. And I'm sitting there just staring at Brother Kelly Patrick, my mind spinning a thousand miles an hour. And I see Brother Rick Treese get up and walk back to the pulpit, tap Brother Kelly Patrick on the shoulder, take the mic away from him as he's giving his preliminaries of his sermon. And he says, the Lord's talking to somebody in here tonight. And he basically goes right down the line of what the Lord had told Mickey. And he says, He said, God said to Moses, take your shoes off because I'm going to tell you something. Surrender. There has to be surrender before there will be revelation. Holy ground has obligation. And he just handed the mic back to him, went down, sat down. And I collapsed. There has to be surrender before there, there will be revelation. I had been praying for two years straight for revelation. And then the Lord says there has to be surrender. Guys, I've sung I Surrender All my whole life. I've been in this since I was a little boy. I got the Holy Ghost at seven years old. I know what surrender looks like, right? No, I didn't know what surrender looked like. I thought I did. We got in the car to go home that night, and I told my wife, I said, I, said, I, I don't know what surrender looks like. I guess. I can't figure this out. I don't know what in the world. That was for me. I know it was. So I start trying to do a discovery to figure out what surrender looks like. It takes me two years. It's 2014 before the Lord showed me in the middle of the night that I had never surrendered my farm and my business to him. And I thought I had, but I had never said, Lord, take it. It's yours. I don't want it. If you want this business, it's yours. I don't want it. If it means we have to start over again or have to go do something else, I have to get a job, I'll do it. I don't want the business. It's yours. I'm done. And the farm, I had bought the farm when I sold my company the first time. And so that was a prize. Does that make sense to you? That had become a, a uh, in, I didn't realize it, but at the time I had idolized it. I, I really did like this place. <laughs> and I had put a lot of money and time in it and it became part of who I was. And so I realized I had never told the Lord, take it. If you want it, you take it. So I surrendered the farm to him. I'll never forget laying on the living room floor about four in the morning on a Sunday morning crying. I just said, Lord, take the farm and take the business. I'm done. It means we move into a mobile home somewhere in the east side of Houston. I don't care. I just can't do this anymore. And I'm telling you, it turned like that. It was crazy what happened. I had been working with a company out of India called Manthan for three years trying to work a deal with them. Couldn't get it to work. They came to the United States stood up a competitive organization to us for three years straight, spent a fortune trying to make it happen. The morning after I surrendered the farm and surrendered the business to the Lord, I'm sitting at my desk, nine o'clock in the morning, phone rings, it's Ganesh from Manthan. He says, Galen, what are you doing? I said, I'm talking to you in India. What do you want? And he said, we've thrown in the towel. He said, Atul Jalan, the, the CEO, uh, told me to call you and tell you that he wants to put all of our capital and investment over into your company and let you guys run with this technology. We'd been trying to get it for three years, and they, they went competitive against me. And they got blocked. They lost every penny they put in the three years. They turned around and fully funded in 2014 to, to integrate Manthan's technologies into my platform. It put us on the map. I did not spend a penny not a cent, except my guy's time. Manthan funded the entire project. So 
I'm, I'm telling you, it's, you know, when, when, when we head off in business and, you know, it, it's, it's easy to, it's easy to think that um, it's about money. It's easy to think that it's about giving, but there's more to it than that. We're supposed to give ourselves. It's not just the money we're giving. We're giving of us. We're giving back to the kingdom. We're giving it into his marvelous light. You, you, you have to reinvest what the Lord's giving you back into the kingdom. And you're going to have abundance. If you do that, you have the abundance. You don't have to worry about your income. The Lord will handle that. But he wants us to be willing to give it all back and willing to, to say, take it. I don't want it. If you want it, you take it. And so I'm going to wrap this up. But I want you to know that I, I believe to the bottom of my heart tonight that if, if you want to do God's work, he's ready for you to do it. The door is open for you to do it. And he will bless what you do as long as you're on purpose. If you will be on purpose, God will bless it. May God bless you. Hey, I want to... I want to thank Brother Walters. You know, we ask every speaker to go against their grain, go against their nature, and to be transparent, to be vulnerable, share the details. It's never easy. It's never fun. It's never exciting. I want to thank him for, for doing that. I know it's blessed me, and it's shown us when you walk in, in truth, when you walk in humility, God will let you walk in favor. And we're seeing that favor, and I believe he can, what he can do for one, he'll do for the other. He's no respecter of persons. And so, Brother Walters, we thank you. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow night for church. <laughs>